everyone, this is Zach, the broker owner of Zach Taylor Real Estate. Today, I wanted to cover the exclusive right to sell listing agreement. So nine times out of 10, whenever you have a listing coming up with a homeowner, you're gonna be using this form. And this form is RF101, so the exclusive right to sell listing agreement. This one is where you are the designated agent. You are the only agent to sell this property for the client. So again, like I said, you'll use this form nine times out of 10. Yes, there are different types of listing agreement forms and I'll cover that in future videos. But today I just wanted to cover how to fill this out, how to use this and different strategies you can use to help more people sign up with you to use you for listing their property. So let's go through this form real quick. And again, I'm not gonna read every single line to make this a really long video. I'm gonna cover kind of broad topics and important points throughout this form. The best thing to do, especially as a real estate agent, you should have read this two, three times before you have anybody sign it. But read this fully, ask me any questions, reach out to the TAR Legal Hotline. There are resources to help you, but definitely read this two, three times, word by word, and make sure you understand it fully. So let's get started. So first line, broker, listing company. So with us, that's going to be Zach Taylor Real Estate. Address of company, you're going to put that here. Oops. Owner or seller. So again, I always recommend for this line, you should put everybody that is on title. So if you have a husband and wife, both of them should go on here. So it could be John Smith and Susan Smith. A lot of times, sometimes you might run into like a power of attorney situation. So at that point, you would put John Smith. Oh, my box just deleted. Add text. You could put John Smith, POA for Susan Smith. Or you might have a trust situation. So again, you would put John Smith trustee for the 123 Main Street Trust, something like that. But most of the time you're gonna have individuals' names. Make sure to put everybody that's on title, John Smith, Susan Smith. Address of owner seller. So this is where the seller lives. This might not be the actual subject property that you're going to be listing. So maybe they live out of town. Maybe they live in 123 Main Street in New York. So wherever they live, that's what you put there. Now this is the property that you're actually selling. That's what address goes here. So for this, we're gonna do 123 Main Street again, but this one is in Nashville. Actually, let me just change this up just so people don't get confused. Let me put 678 Main Street, Nashville. I'm just gonna add a zip code. I know that's not Nashville. Put the county. Next line is deed book and page. So do you guys know where to find that information? If you don't, that's okay, but go to Realtrax or in Paragon, they use something called Mar Data. It's in there. In Realtrax, which is most of you are gonna be using, it's under tax stuff. So either Mar Data tax, or CRS Data, it's one of those tax services. So you would search your property, make sure you have the right county that the property is located in, search your property, and you're going to have results like this pop up. So if I click one, for example, notice here it says a book and page number. If we go back here, book and page number. So book 633, I can just highlight it, copy that, paste, page number, go here, paste, now, these two lines, these two lines, I would say the more you fill out, the better, because the better you're describing the property, there's less room for interpret or like error later on. So commonly what I see put in here is the tax ID number. And then maybe on this line, they put the legal description. Either or works, you can put both. I recommend at least putting one. Sometimes people even put an MLS number if they've already started creating an incomplete listing in real tracks. So just fill out one of these at the bare minimum. So again, if I go back to my CRS data, right here, parcel tax ID number right here. 
So I could copy that and I can even go tax ID number and paste that. So there's that. Or if you want the legal description, just scroll down and then right here, legal description, it shows right here. So you could copy that and paste it over. I usually, whatever number I'm putting, instead of just putting 091002.00, some people might not know what that is. So I label before I put that number what it is. So tax ID, or you could put legal description and then paste that number. Now moving on to what is included with the sale of the property. So this is very important. I always read this line by line with the seller. That way we're setting the expectation of what is included. And so we can get on the same page with each other. So go ahead and read this to your seller and let them know that all window treatments, shutters, blinds, shades, curtains, bathroom mirrors are included, bathroom fixtures, security systems, and you can see everything that's included here. Now, as a real estate agent, it is always important to know that we are not attorneys. So we cannot come in here and add strike throughs like, oh, the curtains, the curtains are being taken by the sellers. You can't do this because as soon as you start striking through the pre-written text, we are voiding the Tennessee Realtor contract. And now we are practicing law. So what we have to do is if something doesn't apply in the pre-written text, use the blanks to override the text. And that is okay. So items that will not remain. So you could say grandma's curtains. You could say the above ground pool. So whatever you need to, items that will not remain. If you put it here, it overrides this text right here. You can, they can put anything that they might wanna leave in, on top of this, on this line item. And let's see, any leased items you would put right here. But this is really important. If you forget something, it's not the end of the world. Most of this listing agreement is to make sure you and the seller are on the same page. What 100% matters is gonna be the purchase and sale agreement, that contract that the, is between the buyer and seller because that is binding between those two parties. This listing agreement, if I accidentally forget to put grandma's curtains on there, it's not the end of the world, like I said. Still, it helps to have everybody on the same page. So another common item you would see here is like the fridge, maybe the washer and dryer. So those are common items that I see put in here. Again, not the end of the world if you forget something. This is not binding with a buyer. A buyer is not signing off on this listing agreement but it just helps a lot of times too, if it's like curtains or maybe they put up a special bathroom mirror that they want, I'm gonna go ahead and tell them, hey, before we even do photos of the property, let's go ahead and take that stuff down. That way there's no confusion whatsoever and there's no buyers that are adding those items in their contract or that, that we don't forget. So let's go ahead and just take those items out of the home before we even list it. And this avoids too any surprises Reading this to the seller, this avoids any last minute surprises when the buyer does the final walkthrough and the seller's taken all the bathroom mirrors. I've seen it happen. Make sure you read this. Listing price. So here is the price that the seller sets. So it is not on us to determine the listing price. We can help them. We can show them what the market is telling us. But at the end of the day, it's the seller's decision. It's their home. It's their price that they want to sell for. So whatever they've determined, let's put that here. Term, so this is how long this listing agreement is in effect. So a lot of times I've seen 90 days, I've seen six months, I've seen a year. Now the market is super hot. So sellers might be trying to get the most competitive terms when they list their home. So if you look at all the sales in a neighborhood and if everything is selling in, on average in 10 days, they're getting an offer in 10 days, then maybe you offer, hey, I'm gonna do a 60 day listing period or a 30 day if you're feeling like it could sell really quick, just make sure you get any extensions if you approach that 30 days. So this could be a negotiation tactic to help you land more listings by not locking somebody up for a year or six months. So try to shorten that down if you can to stay more competitive. So let's just say, I'll say to the end of March. Marketing, so seller directs broker to commence marketing of the property for sale to the general public on the effective date. Effective date is when the, all the sellers have signed this document. That is the effective date. 
So either we're going to start marketing the property when everybody signs on that day, or maybe they're like, hey, I need a week to get ready. So if that's the case, let's see, what's today? The 8th. So let's say they need like a week. So 15th day of March. Maybe they have to clean up things, stage it a little bit, prepare for photo. Photos aren't ready, so they might need some time. Next section, carryover clause. So what this carryover clause is saying, basically, is this is protecting you in, in avoiding situations where a seller might want to go around and try to avoid paying your commission. So let's say, for example, you get the listing first week, you hold an open house, it goes really well, you have all these buyers coming in, and then after that open house, the seller fires you, and they want to terminate this agreement, it's terminated, and then Tuesday of the following week, one of those buyers that came to your open house has agreed to buy that house. Well, you've already introduced that buyer to the seller because you ran that open house. So if you have a carryover clause in effect, you would still have a potential right to get compensated. So use this to protect you. So a lot of times I've seen 90 days here, or I see a lot of agents do 180 days. Like, hey, if you're going to fire me, I've introduced a buyer and you have to wait six months before you can do something with that specific buyer. Like that, it, it just is what it is. Possession of property to be delivered. I don't know why they put a date here because we don't really know when we're going to get an offer come in and then the actual closing date. So what I see here is possession of the property. When are they going to deliver possession to the buyer? So a lot of people put on the closing date or some people put delivery of deed. So whatever you want, whatever you think would best fit here, put that there. Again, this isn't a, a definite rule and legally binding. This is just a general, hey, here's the expectation. Because again, that purchase and sale agreement is going to be the official, here's, here's when it has to be delivered. Terms acceptable to the seller. So this is where they can, you can put, they'll take cash offers. They'll take conventional offers, conventional loan offers. You could put VA. And again, if I just put cash here, maybe the seller just wants cash. If they get a, a buyer that offers a convention, like they need to get a conventional loan in order to buy the home, the seller can still accept that. This is not saying, hey, they only can take a cash offer. No, this is just terms that they are generally looking for. So you can put cash, conventional, whatever is okay with them. Compensation. So this is the total compensation, the total commission that is going to be paid out. This includes you plus the buyer's agent. What is that total that you want to negotiate with the seller? Again, in Tennessee, and I actually across the nation, I believe, but there is no standard commission. There is no set rate. Everything is fully negotiable. So if you want to, if you want to negotiate with the seller and earn 6% total or 5% or five and a half, or maybe a flat fee, maybe it's a higher end home, or maybe you're trying to help family members out, or you're just trying to get the listing. You could put a flat fee regardless of the price point. So let's say for this example, let's put, let's put, uh, let's put five here to make an example later on. So this is asking if the property is leased. What is the commission there? Again, not many of you are going to be focusing on the lease portion. If it's not applicable, you can just leave it alone. Now, this line right here is it confuses some agents with what is the standard for the seller. So right here, what I want to ask is, let's say the seller gets an offer for 500000 and a conventional offer, exactly what's in the listing agreement. Does the seller have to accept that offer? The answer is no. They do not have to agree to anything. It's their house at the end of the day. And we can't say, oh, you have to sell your home. You're re required to. No, it's the seller's property. They can do with what they can do what they want with the home. 
So again, just because it matches these two items does not mean the seller has to sell their home. Some people get tripped up on this line item right here. Let's see, it says, in the event that a ready, willing, and able buyer is produced and a contract results, the seller is obligated to compensate broker in the event the seller unlawfully fails to close or fulfill lease terms by seller's breach of purchase and sale agreement. So this is just saying, if they've gone under contract, if the seller intentionally is breaching the contract, that you might be entitled to your commission. So go ahead and read this. Uh, it also says right here, should the broker consent to release the listing prior to the expiration of the term of this agreement or any extensions, seller agrees to pay all costs incurred by broker to market property or other amount as agreed to by the parties as a cancellation fee. So it's got terminology in here that if the seller wants to get out of this listing agreement that the broker uh, can charge a cancellation fee or whatever cost was to market the property. Again, I don't, I don't typically do this to a seller because it's like, hey, if you fire me, you change your mind to sell your home, whatever else, like, let's just part our ways. I'm not gonna be the agent that goes after sellers for a couple hundred bucks or whatever. Now, section seven, this is going into detail about what are we gonna offer out of this total 5% commission, what are we gonna to offer to a buyer's agent? So this is again, fully negotiable. It does not have to be even every single time. In this seller's market, you'll, you'll see a lot of times listing agents are making more and more and more uh, higher commissions than the buyer's agent. And then when the market eventually flips, sometimes in the future, we don't know when, but it's, it's cyclical. So you have right now listing agents are cashing in, but eventually buyer's agents are gonna cash in. And you might start offering more to a buyer's agent to bring in a, bring in a buyer to help entice, entice them. So again, this does not have to be even, you can even get creative with this. You can do two and a half, you could do two and you keep three. You could do two and a half percent minus, let me extend this box out a little bit, minus $99. And what this means is that the buyer's agent, when this closes, is going to make two and a half percent minus 99. So you make an extra 99, that covers our transaction fee. Now you're earning a full 100% commission. So there's different ways you can structure this to be creative or to help bring in buyer's agents. So let's just put that there. Scroll down. This line item is asking for if the buyer's agent is not a member of the same MLS system we are, are you still gonna offer them a compensation? Now, my viewpoint on this, you can do whatever you want running your business, but I still compensate them. Because for example, we use Realtrax, Memphis uses Paragon, which is a different MLS. Let's say that Memphis agent has a approved buyer ready to go. They travel with their buyer into Nashville, check out some homes and they write an offer they're still a licensed agent through the state. They're still a realtor. Like I'm going to offer them a commission just as I would if they were a Realtrax agent. So I usually, whatever I put here, I go ahead and put here. Let's see. Broker is authorized to place a real estate sign and lockbox on the property and to remove all other real estate signs. You can give out the property condition disclosure, the disclaimer, exemption, or property disclosure form the MLS listing sheet. So this is just saying I can share all that information with the buyer's agent. I can also take uh, interior, exterior photos and videos taken. So this is kind of describing to a seller what's gonna start happening when we have the listing. We also, as the realtor can receive offers on behalf of the seller, we have to promptly send all offers to the seller, but we will receive those first. That's what that's saying, hold harmless right here. Again, I don't wanna read all this to you because this video would be twice as long. Let's see, seller acknowledge, this is good points to cover with the seller. Seller acknowledges and agrees that broker may show other properties to prospective buyers who are interested in the seller's property. So just because a buyer comes in, I can still show them other properties if they ask. So that's a good thing to cover with the seller. We're not experts in regards to surveys, title searches, inspections. One thing I was taught really early on as a real estate agent is stay in our lane. 
So we help them sell the home. We help them get offers, field offers, help them with the contract paperwork like this. So that's our lane. So we should not be volunteering, hey, we'll do inspections for you, or hey, we'll run a title search for you. No, stay in our lane as real estate agents. That way too, we're adding more liability to ourselves when we start stepping out of our lane. Seller owe no duties or shall owe no duties to seller nor have any authority to act on behalf of seller other than what is set forth in this agreement may make all disclosures required by law and or the National Association of Realtors Code of Ethics. So a big, big thing with this line item right here is, and it's covered also, again, in this contract with adverse facts, but we are, as realtors, if we know of something that greatly affects the value of real estate, so you see right here, negative impact on the value of real estate, then we should still disclose that if we know of it. So like if there's a giant leak in the roof, the owner has a, a big old tub in the attic that collects all the water. So when people are walking through, they don't see a leak because the bucket's collecting it. Like, yeah, we got to disclose that. That's, that means the roof, the structure of it is off. So we still have to disclose adverse facts. It is on the seller too to disclose any of that stuff. But again, that's what that's covering. Duties owed to all parties to a transaction. This is good to read to a seller line by line. So if you kind of have them say, hey, please review everything and then sign if it's acceptable to you. One thing I cover as well is duties to all parties. So diligently exercise reasonable skill and care in providing services to all parties. Disclose to each party to the transaction any adverse facts of which licensee has actual knowledge, notice or knowledge. Maintain confidentiality, provide services to each part of the transaction with honesty and good faith. Let's see, timely account for earnest money deposits, duties owed to client. So this is to the seller themselves, obey all lawful instructions, be loyal to the interests of the client, schedule all property showings on behalf of the client, receive all offers and counter offers for them promptly to the client, answer any questions that the client may have in negotiation of a successful Purchase agreement, advising the clients as to whatever forms, procedures, and steps are needed after execution of the purchase agreement. So here's the duties that we have to give to the seller. So again, this is another selling point that you could use as to why they should hire you is, look, I will help with all these items right here. Appoint, appointment of designated agent. So this is where you will actually put your name as the agent that is going to help this seller. So the managing broker hereby appoints, I, I put myself here, or if you have a different agent, whatever your name is, put yourself as the designated agent for that property. You're the one and only to help that seller. Home protection plan. Again, this is not a definite. This can be negotiated further in the contract. So even if you put waived, or if the seller wants to go and offer a home protection plan, and for those of you that may not know, a home protection plan is basically there are different companies out there that you pay a couple hundred bucks to them and you have just purchased a home protection plan. And what that does is most of the time is let's say you bought the plan and the fridge goes out the next week. Well, usually for a small service charge fee, like 75 bucks, hundred bucks, they might replace that entire fridge. So you save having to pay 1500, two grand for a fridge. Same thing with like other appliances, maybe plumbing leaks. There's all the di different things that a home protection plan covers. So that's just what that is. Again, if you put waived, you can negotiate it later that it is included in a purchase sale agreement. Binding agreement, here's just some reading material for you. Please read this two or three times before you actually work with a seller. Terminology, calendar days ending at 1159, PM local time is what's used in this. Anything confidential that the seller authorizes you to share, any exhibits and addenda, special stipulations. So what I've used in special stipulations, again, the blanks can override any of the pre-written text. So I can say seller may terminate this agreement at any time in writing and have a $0 
cancellation fee. So th this is providing more reasons for a seller to work with me. Hey, if, if you don't like working with me, if I'm not doing my job, you can fire me at any time and there's none of that marketing fee or whatever else. So there's different terms you can put in here to help yourself secure the listing. And then you would sign here as the licensee. The, both the sellers or all the sellers would sign here. If you have another one, you can add signature boxes. So that is the exclusive right to sell listing agreement. This was more of a comprehensive video to kind of cover different ideas, different strategies, to help you get that listing. Again, we are blank fillers as real estate agents. Do not be, don't cross out the pre-written text. And then definitely ask me if you have any questions, ask the TAR legal hotline if you have any questions. And hopefully this helps you guys out in securing more listings. And I'll see you guys next time.